This week, New Mexico Secretary Ryan Flynn with the New Mexico Environment Department made the decision to clean the Class 3 permit modification request that was currently up for public consideration. This modification suggested several changes to the WIP underground, including the process for panel closure, VOC monitoring, and where panels 9 and 10 will be located. This permit modification was not an expansion to WIP. It added no volume or scope to the project. And I believe it makes a number of changes that will ultimately improve the safety of the WIP underground. This permit modification process has also been ongoing for more than a year now. There was another public comment period about this permit last spring. That said, I fully understand Secretary Flynn's decision to pull the permit modification at this time. The permit modification involves suggested changes to the WIP underground, but until we know more about what caused this incident, it is unreasonable to expect the public to be able to comment. There's no way to know whether all the changes are appropriate until the DOE is able to get down into the mines, find out what really happened, determine the extent of the cleanup, and determine the path forward. I would also like to note that it's been almost a month now since the state, through Secretary Flynn, requested that Department of Energy Secretary Moniz directly visit WIP. Since then, Secretary Moniz has visited Washington State to discuss Hanford, but has not made a trip to New Mexico. I've also personally invited him to call us back with no response. I appreciate Secretary Flynn's responsible oversight of this project. I also wanted to again thank Senators Tom Udall and Martin Heinrich for their effort with the EPA in bringing additional monitoring to the region. I know that the Department of Energy and NWP have both brought in a number of experts to help with the recovery process. This assistance is needed and appreciated. But I also appreciate comments made at last week's town hall meeting that you will continue to rely on the local expertise of those who know the facility well, people such as Baroque Sharif and Joe Franco. I also hope that each edition of a recovery expert doesn't mean that we are back to square one in the process. While I know there's been some progress in getting underground, I do not believe progress has been fast enough. It's been six weeks now, and the slow process is eroding credibility and causing people to speculate as to whether the response 
would have been just as slow where there an emergency need. Please do not let bureaucracy get in the way of common sense. I'm also concerned after reading the preliminary criticism about the radiological event outlined in the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board report. According to the report, response to the release was not handled properly in some ways on February 14th and 15th. This community will be demanding more assurances on safety practices in the future. <coughs> Placing the blame squarely on the local office here is also not acceptable. The DOA office in Washington is also accountable for what happens at WIP. Additionally, I would like to ask for assurances for the job retention of NWP contractors and other contractors to the Department of Energy. I want to conclude by stating that the city of Carlsbad very much stands with the men and women who work at WIP. The recovery process and getting the waste isolation pilot plant back open. WIP remains the right solution, but major changes are going to be needed to be made. I'll now turn this over to Bradley Berger with the Department of Energy. Thank you, Mayor. Um, John Heaton couldn't be with us tonight, so they've asked me to be the moderator, and I'd just like to lay out sort of the rules of engagement before we get started. We're going to have a couple of presentations tonight, and after each presentation, we'll ask for questions. We'll start with the folks here in the audience, and uh, we'll have a handheld mic that we'll uh, bring to you, and then we'll ask the people who are responding to the questions to repeat the questions, because we know that uh, the folks who are on the webcast can't hear the handheld mic, so it's a... It's a uh, a little clunky, but it works. Uh, we're going to, as I said, we'll have a couple of presentations, and we're going to start off with uh, Joe Franco, uh, who is the, uh, the DOE Carlsbad office manager. Joe? As, uh, as the mayor had stated, you know, this is uh, our third one uh, for our weeklies here with, with the mayor. It's, uh, I think, my fifth one. Uh, we continue to make progress, and we're going to talk about that today and uh, let you know where we're at and what we're doing and why uh, uh, patience is needed and why we're taking our time and, and why it's important for that to continue to be the process that we use. Um, uh, the mayor had some key points that uh, brought out that uh, um, we have been uh, listening to. Um, we also uh, have been working with Secretary Flynn and the EPA uh, and have uh, continued to share information with them and also support them as they come out to the facility, collect samples and provided them all of the data that we have and uh, allowed them to question the data and uh, we have also answered any of those. We've also continued to uh, support Dr. Russell Hardy and his team from CMERC um, as they come out and um, collect their samples and then uh, any of the data that needs to be shared back and forth. So we're going to start off the meeting, um, we're going to let uh, Ms. Tammy Reynolds, she's, she's been doing the, uh, she works for the Nuclear Waste Partnership, um, the, our, our contractor, our m and and she's been uh, really the spearhead in the um, uh, recovery, kind of the recovery lead right now and, and manager for that out at the facility. Um, she has been there every day pretty much and uh, I don't think there's been one day you haven't been there. And so uh, we talked to her early in the morning and late at night to get the status of what's happening from the beginning of the day and then what happened at the end of the day. And uh, I know that uh, she hears from DOE probably way more than she would like to, but uh, she has kept us well apprised of the situations. And when something new comes up, she has been the one that has provided that for us. So with that, I'll let her start uh, this status. Thank you, Joe. I'd like to start by saying that I'm very happy to be here, and I want to tell you that I feel honored to represent a lot of folks that aren't necessarily here tonight, but that have put in many, many long hours over the past several weeks to um, accomplish what I'm going to talk to you about tonight. So um, to them, you know, I certainly share my appreciation for all the hard work that they've been doing.
Okay, so let me start out by, and what I'm going to do is walk you through several of the um, key recovery activities that we've been working on. The first one is the installation of what's called a continuous air monitor at Station B. So now Station B, let me see if I can do this right, that picture that you see up there at the top, that is the exhaust stack, and out of the end of that exhaust stack is where filtered air is currently going out into the environment. And the monitor that you see in this picture below there is what's called a continuous air monitor. And what that monitor is going to do for us is going to provide real-time information if there's anything coming out of that stack that we need to be concerned about. And so we're very um, excited to get that monitor in place because one of our challenges has been that we don't have real-time monitoring. And so sometimes there's a delay in us determining what is coming out of the stack. So by the end of this week, we will have that installed. It's actually installed right now, and we're monitoring to make sure that the piece of equipment is functioning like it's supposed to. And we're going to watch it for about a week, make sure that it's operating properly. And then ultimately, it's going to be tied into our control room. And so that um, in real time, we will know if there's any concern of anything coming out of the stack. And what we will do with that information, if it hits an alarm, you know, point, then we will be able to respond and take protective actions, such as sheltering personnel indoors, and then the appropriate actions that we would need to take from that. So a lot of hard work's gone into that, and um, should have that in place and monitor that, and we'll be able to report real-time information. The second item that we're working on is the venting of TruePak 2 and TruePak 3 containers. So a TruePak three container, that's what that is right there, and that's a true pack two container. So those containers came into the website prior to the events, and we have a requirement um, from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to vent those containers within 60 days. One of the reasons for that requirement is there could potentially be a buildup of gases in those containers, and so one of the regulatory requirements is to vent them. We started that venting operation on Tuesday, and probably later tonight, um, we will finish, we're scheduled at least to finish those later tonight. So um, that's another activity that we've had some folks working on over the past few days, and then um, we'll complete that later tonight. Okay, so now I'll talk a little bit about the re-entry activities. So the entry activities have been broken down into phases, and a couple of those have already completed. The first phase was a couple of weeks ago, and we started very methodically going through these phases, and the primary goal and objective in each phase is to make sure that we put the right controls and the right precautions in place to protect the workers, because ultimately to get personnel into the mine, we want to make sure that we methodically step through piece by piece to get them into the mind but make sure when we get them there that they're safe, that the environment they're going to go into is safe and that we're protecting them appropriately from any hazards that they might encounter. So the first of those was to take the oops, air intake shaft, which is that right there, and then the salt shaft right there, and then that's at the bottom of the mine. We have to, um, we wanted to make sure that going down on either one of those shafts, it was going to be what we consider to be habitable environments. So we needed to monitor to make sure there were not any hazardous gases in the air, and we also needed to make sure that there was not any, what I'm going to call contamination. And to kind of put that in a different perspective, if you think about like dust particles or talcum powder, that if you kind of spread it up in the air, you can't see it. So they're very minute particles that you can't see with the naked eye, but we needed to make sure that neither one of those existed, or if they did, then we knew what the environment was like at the bottom of those shafts so that we could put the right safety controls in place to protect the people that we would ultimately send in the line. So a couple of weeks ago, we <coughs> lowered instruments that detected gases as well as for these particles, radioactive particles. We put instruments on both of those, lowered those slowly down to the bottom of the mine, and brought both of those you know, instruments back up for both of those. 
And as we expected, we didn't see any hazardous gases, nor did we um, find any um, contamination, any radioactive contamination in either one of those locations. Now, because of the ventilation system, that was expected because the ventilation, the air flows from those areas into the mine and away from the shaft. So it was what we expected, and we were glad to see those results. So this week, um, earlier this week, we took the next step. And in these, to, we have weekly, we have mine safety requirements to do shaft inspections. And the way you do those shaft inspections is you have, kind of like in an elevator, where you go in the elevator to go from one floor to the other, you have to put a person or people on top of that elevator cage, if you will, and they have to go down and inspect the shaft as they're going down to the bottom of the mine. So this week we did that for both of those two shafts again. And as we expected, and from the unmanned entries, we did not detect any gases that were, would be hazardous, nor did we detect any radioactive contamination. Now these folks, as we lowered them down into those shafts, they were in protective equipment because we always take a conservative approach to make sure we're protecting the employees. And again, that was the successful results on both of those. Okay, so the next entry, the next phase is now to establish an operating base in the underground. And what that means is we will take personnel and we will lower them in the shaft. We'll, what we'll do is we'll go down the salt shaft. That's the normal shaft that we would use to take personnel down. And we will lower them to the bottom. And that team of personnel will be in protective equipment. They will have um, gloves. They will have kind of like coveralls on, so we'll protect them and they'll also have respiratory equipment because once again, even though we've already accomplished those first two steps and we haven't seen any hazards, once they get to the bottom of those, the salt shaft, now we're gonna have to have them walk from the salt shaft over to the air intake shaft. One of the requirements is if you have personnel in the underground mine, you have to have two exit points. So that will be the salt and the air intake shaft. And so they will walk their way from the bottom of the salt shaft, making sure that you know, the conditions are safe for them to do so to establish that half of egress at the air intake shaft. So that's the first thing they'll do. And then what they'll do after that is they will walk along another area of the uh, mine and establish what we call an operating base. When you go in the underground, and because of the conditions that we will ultimately you know, be exposed to in the underground, we need to make sure that we set up an area down there that the personnel, when they come back to the surface, we don't want to bring any contamination or any hazardous <coughs> gases or anything like that back on the surface. So we have to establish an operating base down there, and that will allow the personnel to transition from a contamination area into a clean area and then back up on the surface. And I'm going to show you a map in just a minute. And I'll walk you through those paces as to where they're going to go in the underground. And then the fourth phase is, and again, we will stop after each one of those phases. So after phase three, we're going to sit down and we're going to, from the people that go down in the mine, from cameras taking pictures, from the, the equipment that they're going to be using to monitor for contamination as well as hazardous gases, we will sit down and we will debrief and learn everything that we can from that entry. And then we will add controls if necessary or change some of our plans before we take the next step and allow folks to go back down again and start the next phase of the recovery process. So the phase, the fourth phase is once we have established that operating base, then we will proceed down the mine towards the south end to where we are likely to see where the event occurred. And that's towards panel seven or potentially towards panel six. And again, they will have the um, protective equipment on, they will have uh, respirator equipment that supplies air to them. They will be fully clothed with gloves and shoes such that none of their skin is exposed on their face or the rest of their bodies. And then when, and they will be surveying with these instruments all the way along that path to make sure that they know what the conditions are every step of the way. 
And at some point, if they reach a situation or a condition where it's not safe for them to proceed, because in the packages, the work packages they'll be using, there are requirements that we've already predetermined that what we expect to see, and if they see something that doesn't fall into those pre-established requirements, then they turn around and come back out. And then we will sit down and readdress the potential hazards, <coughs> put in the right controls, and then proceed after we feel comfortable with all of those controls. Okay, so let me use this map and I'll walk you through um, the establishment of the operating base. So the salt shaft right here, that's where the team will go down. And it's going to be a team, there'll be probably around 16 people. We're still finalizing the final team complement, but it'll be roughly around 16 people. They'll go into the salt shaft and they will walk down this area right here to the air intake shaft. So that's where doing that, they will have established their two um, areas of egress. Then they will walk back to the salt shaft, and then we're going to go over here to um, check an instrument that we want to check, and then come back to the salt shaft, and then we're going to go down this green path here, a piece of the way, monitoring the whole way to determine um, what contamination levels the individuals are seeing. Again, you know, we expect they're going to get contamination on the protective equipment they're wearing, but they're fully protected as far as not getting any contamination on their skin. And because of the breathing respirators and all, they will not be breathing any of this contamination. So at that point, they're going to set up one of these continuous air monitors, similar to what I talked about earlier. They're going to set one of those up, and then they will leave. They'll come back up to the surface, and we'll talk about any lessons learned, what they saw, we'll look at the videos that they're going to take, look at the pictures they're going to take, and then incorporate any of those lessons learned into our work documents before we proceed. Okay, then we'll go back in the mine and again go in through the salt shaft. This time they don't have to walk to the air intake shaft because we've already established that that path is safe and so we've got both means of egress. And then this green line here, they'll walk all the way down towards panel seven where we believe to be where the event occurred. And if necessary, we'll end up going to panel six. But back at this area right here, we're going to establish another operating base. You want to have your operating base as close to where you find the contamination as possible. And because the airflow is this direction, what we predict we will see is that we will not see contamination until somewhere close to where the event scene occurred. Because it's unlikely that the, air, that the um, contamination would have gone this direction since the airflow is this way. So that's what we expect to see and the controls are in place um, based on that. So they will establish the operating base here. There's the likelihood depending on you know, how much contamination we see there that we may put them in different protective equipment. We may go from coveralls to a full plastic suit that folks will wear. Again, that's as we learn more as we go in the underground, those are some of the changes in controls that will make us more conservative as we learn more information. Okay, so a couple other items that we're working on. Today we performed um, an air in-service aerosol test of the ventilation system filter bags. So try to visualize in your homes, you have an air conditioning system or heating system before the air goes back out to the, um, the unit. You usually have a filter in there. Most people have you know, a slide-in filter that you know, every month or so you go and change. Well, this is somewhat similar to that, but these are much larger filters. They're in this building here. And these filters do several things for us. They do get out the um, you know, dirt and things like that, debris, large items like dirt. But they also filter out the contamination, these particles that we don't want being released to the environment. And so um, one of the things that we wanted to do is, even though we have a lot of instruments that tell us how these are performing, you know, more information is always good. 
And because we are relying on these filters, this is a very critical component of the ventilation system, we wanted to do a, an in-service aerosol test. And what I mean by that is there's, if you've been to concerts where you see, you know, folks do these smoke, the smoke going up in the air and all that kind of stuff, you take a machine kind of like that and they inject smoke on one side of the filters and see how much smoke comes out through the other side. And from that, they can tell the efficiency, how well that filter is working and whether it's time to change the filter out or, you know, can you, you know, utilize the filter for longer. So that was a test that we did today and it, you know, determined and it, uh, verified for us that these filters are working. And so um, it gave us another data point to let us know that the filters are doing their job and that they are filtering out the air, that um, the particulates out of the air that we don't want going out into the environment. So we were happy to get that done today. Um, you know, should there come a time later that we need to change out these filters at some point in time, then we already have preparations in, you know, being in place right now and personnel being trained to go execute those work activities. Again, there's a lot of planning that goes into that because we have to make sure that the safety controls are in place for personnel to go in and change these filters because any contamination that would have come out of the underground would potentially be on these filters. And so we have to approach that job with that in mind and hear personnel from training and also with protective equipment to do that task. And then the last thing I wanted to mention is I know that it's on everyone's mind, the return of the workforce to the WIP site. And we've been busily working through a lot of these activities in preparation for that. So the first thing that I talked about, the continuous air monitor, it's very important for us to have that real-time information available so that we can make real-time decisions should um, there be a need to perform protective actions. So, um, putting that can in place, that continuous air monitor in place, is um, a vital step in um, us being comfortable with returning the workforce to the website. And then the last and the other activity that we were trying to accomplish is this in-service um, test that we performed today and they gave us the results that we were hoping to receive from that. Okay. So Do we have it. any questions? Yes, ma'am. I was wondering why the continuous air monitor wasn't installed at the inception. Isn't that a, a something that you'd want to have when you started all this? Can, and can you repeat the questions so the folks on the webcast can hear them? The, um, the question was, why was the continuous air monitor not installed at the, at the inception? inception of WIPs, yeah. So the system is designed that there are continuous air monitors underground, and if they see anything, what they do is they switch the ventilation system to filtration mode, and so there were other and are other continuous air monitors in the system that actually would have given us that information earlier, and the system did operate like it was designed to operate. So as soon as the underground continuous air monitor told us there was a problem, the ventilation system switched over to this mode that where it goes through these filter banks now and does filter the air before it goes out to the environment. And uh, if you can also uh, claim that there is a fixed air sample still being collected there. It's not. So, yeah. so the other kind of part of the other answer to that is that at all times we were actually drawing a sample out of the exhaust we had a fixed air sampler that was drawing that, and that's where we actually were able to put those filters in through our laboratory to find out how much of that release that we did in the initial that was identified. So that was um, um, something that was that still in operation. This is just a, another supplement to give real time uh, for what's actually in the exhaust. That, as Tammy said, uh, the underground, we do have a, a cam, as we mentioned in the very beginning, uh, when we started having these. There was a cam, if we can flip over to your, I, I'm not sure how much, so if you look at panel seven there, um, if you see the, let me see right here, here's the waste space, where the waste is right now in panel seven, where we had actually put the last, before the event. We actually had a cam or uh, right up here. And so the airflow comes down here and it goes back up this way down and then up the exhaust shaft. And that is where the cam that found or saw the event and that triggers the whole system to shift over to filtration. So. One 
follow up. So the one that you started with, that's in addition to what's that's already underneath. So correct. that's on the outside now. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Can you go back to the slide that has stage three and stage four in it? I can. Of your re entry activities? Okay. Uh, you're saying there are protective equipment in phase three, two pairs of protective clothing and a respirator, and then in phase four you say two pairs of protective clothing or plastic suit and breathing air system. Can you explain the difference between the two or are they the same? Okay, so let me repeat the question. So the question was in phase three and phase four, what is the difference in phase three where I talk about two pairs of protective clothing and a respirator? And then in phase four, where we show two pairs of protective clothing or a plastic suit and breathing air, what's called a BG4. Okay, so to start out, and both of these are based on what we find as far as contamination levels in the underground. So when I talk about two pair, it's basically a set of coveralls with long sleeves all the way down to the floor. You put two of those pairs on, they're going to put gloves on, you typically take the gloves to that, take the boots that you're going to wear to the bottom of your coveralls so that there's no way for any particle to get through that and onto your skin. Okay, and then the respirator is a pressurized air respirator, so it's going to be providing its own air to the individual. So as they're going down through the mine, depending on the monitors, what the monitors are reading, depending on the contamination levels, because some of the things you have to be concerned about with the two pair is it gets hot having two pairs of coveralls on, and then also depending on the contamination levels, you get to a point where it's better, it's safer for the individual to put them in a plastic suit. Because that way, these contamination levels, there's less likelihood of you um, having a particle get through your clothing or you're sweating and you know, having contamination to their skin, because that's the one thing you want to guard against. So if we, as we're walking down the path towards panel seven, if the contamination levels get too high, then it's better for us to switch them from two pair to a plastic suit. And then the VG4, where the pressurized respirator will typically give you about an hour to an hour and a half worth of air. The VG4 will give you eight hours worth of air. Now we don't expect we need eight hours, but that would, you know, we can go to that and have plenty of time and respirate it. And then as they're coming out, what they do is they'll take off at the operating base. They will take off whether it's the coverall or the plastic suit. They take that off in a very careful manner, and there's methods to how you do this, so that you're taking that contamination away from you, and then they will get back into what you might call, like, in radiological terms, street clothes, or back to um, you know, basic clothes when they can come back to the surface. Does that answer your question? Yes, Other questions? Oh. First of all, I have some wonderful news. Our, our wireless mic is apparently working online today, so good news for everybody. Um, we've got several questions online, but I'm going to ask some of the ones related to this. First of all, is in terms of information availability, there was one request that in future town hall meeting slides such as this be made available immediately prior to the town hall, maybe so people could look at it while you're talking, or and then on, will this be available after this meeting? Okay, the answer is yes to that. And then um, the second question was similar, is will the videos of the cameras and the shafts, tunnels, and accident site work-related videos be made public? All of those, uh, you know, we'll have to look and make sure that we don't have any kind of uh, personal type reason not to disclose that uh, information, but the intent is to be transparent and just show what we have, uh, what we found. So the answer is yes. And then I've got one more related to this topic, I think, is question, is there anything to learn from the current Hanford situation, and are you collaborating with them? Uh, are either of you familiar with the current Hanford situation? Uh, which one is that? Are we talking about the, the tank, um, tank vapors? vapors? You want to address that, Joe? Yeah, um, we are familiar with that. Uh, we have not. Uh, it is a chemical uh, item that they're working through. We're working through our radiological at this point. 
so we we have I have talked to, or have actually had some um, um, contact with uh, some of the folks there, but we have not shared um, if there's any similarity because they're treating it through a chemical side of the house. Any other questions, Pam? Uh, let's get to the rest. Okay. Other folks? My voice is plenty loud enough. Well, this way they can hear you on the webcast. I just am wondering, has the site been closed since February 14th? Is that, is that accurate? So the question was, has the site been closed? Um, no, ma'am, the site has not been closed. There are personnel out there actively working these activities that we... Okay, and a follow-up to that. Where does the waste that should be going to WIPS go if WIPS is closed? So there are no more shipments currently coming into WIP. So the waste that's being um, packaged at the generator sites, what I call the generator sites with different places across the country, they're staying at those locations. I know there's some that, so there's some packages. Um, there's a contract being put in place for the um, waste control specialist location to take some waste that's in the complex right now and hold it for temporary storage until we can accept it back at will. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. I have not been able to attend all these meetings, but I th to me, this is the first time that uh, in a slide it's mentioned that you are thinking it might be panel seven or panel six. So could you go to the slide with the um, uh, underground map and maybe explain what the normal ventilation flow out of panel six would be and whether that could have possibly activated the cam there? Uh, because I have some geotechnical background and for me the two scenarios that at least in public have been most bandied about and that is a failing rock bolt that punctures a drum or a roof fall about the least likely place for that to happen would be in room seven of panel seven because that's the freshest part of the entire disposal area. Mm -hmm. It would be to my mind at least until we find otherwise much more likely that something happened in panel six rather than in panel seven. So could you address that? Okay. All right, so the question was, uh, I've got the map up here of the mine and the question was panel six and panel seven, why do we think that the event occurred in either of those areas. Did that capture it? So the ventilation flow, as I indicated, um, this air intake shaft, one of the reasons it's named that is because the air comes in at that location. Now there is some air that comes in from the salt shaft, but most of it comes in through the air intake shaft. So the direction of the ventilation flow is this direction right here. And then it comes around and ultimately comes back up this direction and goes out the exhaust shaft. So if you see with the flow of ventilation going that direction, if something occurred in panel 7, and one of the reasons we likely think it is panel 7 is because the only two panels that are currently open, if you will, are panel 7 because that's the one where we were currently working and placing waste. And then panel six, even though we have it closed, it's not a permanent closure on that panel, and that was the last panel we were in. So most likely here, because of where the cam that went into a warm, if, if it is in panel six, and again, there's a lot of information we don't know yet, this cam is here, which is upstream, so the ventilation flow going this direction, panel six would have been downstream of that ventilation flow. So that's why, from what we know right now, we feel like panel seven is the more likely one, but because panel six doesn't have the permanent closure in there, that could still be a candidate. And you think then that there might be at least a possibility that something from panel six might have flowed back and affected that cam, so at least you can't exclude that possibility? Right, that's, that's why it's a continuum. Okay. Right. Other questions for Tammy? Any more online, Kyle? Um, well, let's, I'll ask this one and then Tammy can answer it or maybe Mr. Parker can answer it. Um, the question is, would you be able to ask the reason for the DNFSB letter comment that if the release had occurred three days earlier, the significance of the release would have been several orders of magnitude greater? I guess, Joe, they're asking for you to address the, that. The, 
the, um, the, the letter from the board um, or the discussion there that they had was that uh, during, after the fire, the ventilation system was put in a disabled uh, mode. And the way that that happened was for a uh, few days there, that whole system was bypassed. And so if that would have happened during that time, the board is correct. We would have had a different release uh, quantities that we would have been discussing. Okay, any other questions for Tammy before we let her sit down? Oh, got one here. Yes, Tammy, I wanted to find out to see after you guys established your phase three and phase four, are we going to have to, or I should say the team that actually goes in there, are they going to have to constantly be wearing protective equipment if you do not detect anything or do not find anything? Okay, so the question is, once we get to phase three, would we be wearing protective equipment after that? Did I capture that correctly? Okay. All right, so the answer to that would be yes, because we will be more conservative than not. Um, until we know what has occurred in the underground and feel that we've mitigated the situation, um, we would continue to stay in protective equipment. Other questions for Tammy? Okay, thank you very much, Tammy. Thank you. Thanks. Good question, too. <coughs> okay, now we'd like to uh, allow Fran Williams to. Um, Brief us on the bioassays and the samples that we have out at the facility. Thanks, Jim. Well, it's nice to see you all again. I have a slide that I'm going to talk about. Um, the last time I was here, I talked more about the environmental sampling. And so tonight, I want to talk about the sampling that we've been doing on our employees. You heard Tammy say that we work very hard to prevent contamination and getting on our employees or getting in our employees, either on their skin or in their lungs, in, in their body. We work very hard. We've got engineered controls. You've heard her talk about protective equipment. We've got rules and orders and training. A lot of different systems go into that. A lot of work goes into it. However, if we suspect that someone is contaminated or if someone gets contaminated, we treat that extremely seriously. And one of the things we do is biological monitoring. And that's what this chart is about. Bioassay, the definition is at the top, and that's an NRC, a Nuclear Regulatory Commission definition. And I use that because I wanted you to see it's not just specific to the Department of Energy facilities. But the bioassay sampling means that you're going to determine the kinds, the quantities, the concentrations of these nuclear materials and the locations in the body so that you can determine the dose, the unit of exposure to those individuals. So if it's suspected or if you know that it has occurred, you have really three options for biological monitoring. You can take fecal samples and those are good really very soon after the event. And they would determine what has gone through your digestive tract. And I say very soon after the event, because very soon they're eliminated from the digestive tract into the, fe into the fecal matter. A second option is urine samples. Urine samples allow us to determine with very specific, very low levels, any amount of radioactive contamination that an employee or a person has breathed into their lungs. And basically what happens is the majority of it stays in their lungs but some of it moves out into the, the biological systems, the blood, the bone, those types of things. And that which makes it to the blood then goes out to the kidney and the bladder and in the urine. A third option is what we call the chest count. They put some monitors over your chest and they do a direct reading of any activity that's in your lungs. That methodology is not good for either low energy you know, uh, emitters, when they decay, they emit energy. So the, it's not good for low energy, and so it's not good in all cases. So we have those three options. Bioassay sampling, which is fecal, urine, or chest count. 
And my purpose tonight is to update you on some new sample results. Before I do that, I want to give you a little analogy because a lot of people don't understand how this process works. So I'm thinking you go to your doctor and you're going to have either a physical or you have something that's bothering you and you want him to check it out. He might ask for a blood sample. He might ask for a urine sample. He might even ask for a fecal sample. He sends those samples to a laboratory. That laboratory performs an analysis of those samples. That analysis, the results of those analysis, comes back to your physician, and he interprets those. And, and if you remember, usually you'll get a readout from him. And that readout will have a range that he wants your results to be in. So I think of triglycerides, your blood sugar. I think of cholesterol. Um, diabetes, the test for diabetes. He's looking for a range. And if you're outside of that range, he's going to investigate that. He wants to know why you're not in the range. So he might ask for another sample. He might ask for triglycerides. Did you have a milkshake just before you had your blood test? Or your urine test? He's, he's going to investigate that. And again, he might request another sample. He gives you the results, and you might not be confident in those results. And you might decide, I'm going to go for a second opinion. I'd like someone else to tell me, could this be something else than what he's telling me? And over the years, those ranges have changed. Right? If you think of cholesterol, 250 used to be OK. Then it went down to 220, and now it's 200. If you look at diabetes, greater than 126, you've got diabetes. He's going to change your diet, put you on medication. If you're between 100 and 126, you might be what they call pre-diabetes. And he might recommend that you do some adjustments. He might try to get that number below 100. And below 100, you don't have diabetes. Well, it's, it's very analogous to what we do with the urine and fecal samples. A health physicist determines that maybe you were exposed to some contamination, and they request a sample. The individual provides the sample, and the sample is sent to a laboratory where it's analyzed. The analysis results come back to the health physicist, and the health physicist <coughs> is comparing those results against several ranges. And if he's on the high, if the sample result is on the high end of this range, he's going to ask questions about where did the employee work if he doesn't, if he doesn't know, what task was he performing. He might look at the laboratory and try to determine was the quality assurance and quality control programs correct. But if he has a positive, he's going to ask for a resample. The WIP initial bioassay results that we reported to you of 17 positive fecal samples followed by negative urine samples continue to be evaluated. And one of the things we did was we asked for a second opinion. We brought in an independent, outside expert in dosimetry to make sure that we were administering this process exactly how we should and as well as we could. And you heard Tammy say conservative, as conservatively as we could. And that independent expert identified a more conservative and appropriate range that we should be applying to these bioassay sample results. And when you do that, we identify three additional fecal sample and one additional urine sample that should be considered positive. So what does it mean? The results of the samples, the activity in the samples, hasn't changed. What's changed is what we're measuring the results against. And if you remember, the CDC did validate, did confirm the urine sample results. So the use of the more conservative range means we are much less likely to miss any positive. It also means that we will see some what I call false positives. Background is not constant. You saw that, for, well, if you were here last week, you saw that from the experiment Dr. Hardy conducted, where he pulled an air sample here, and then he counted it, and there was activity on that. I would offer that if he did that a week from today, the results would be slightly different because background isn't constant. And so you can see some false positives when your goal 
is to measure as low of a quantity as we're trying to measure in these bioassay samples. Like the earlier positive fecal samples, these three positive fecal samples also submitted a urine sample, and that urine sample was less than, it was a negative, there was no activity in it. So those individuals would receive a dose that would be less than or equal to roughly around 10 millirems. Now I want to talk about 10 millirems because I keep saying millirem is just a unit of exposure. And we compare that to an x-ray, a chest x-ray, which is also about 10 millirem. And people say to me that it's not the same. If you have it inside, it's not the same as, if you will, an acute one-time <coughs> x-ray. Well, actually, it is. And the reason it is is because that milliram calculation that we conduct basically equalizes the different types of radioactivity that could be in your lung. So if you say it's uranium, you're going to need a much larger quantity of uranium in your lung to give you the same dose as, say, americium or plutonium. And because of the way we're required to report, that 10 milligram, or less than 10 milligram, that is represented by these positive bioassay samples, is a 50-year dose. So we calculate it to be an acute dose. So if the individuals that receive that exposure live another 50 years, they will receive another 10 milligram. And again, chest x-ray is 10 milligram. The natural background in this area is 310 milligram over one year. So much less than they'd get from background in one year. For the positive urine sample, just like your doctor, a resample has been requested. And we will count that sample and we will communicate those results. So to date, just to recap, we've received and processed 22 fecal samples. They've been analyzed through the laboratory and then reviewed by the health physicist. And 20 of those have been positive. We've processed and reviewed 123 urine samples. And one of those has been positive with a follow-up sample requested. My belief is that is one of those false positives. We designed this system to give us a 95% confidence level, which means you should see 5% false positive. You could see 5%. All of these results that I just told you have been confirmed by the outside independent internal dosimetry expert, and all future results will be confirmed by that individual. We talked about air sampling, surface water sampling, vegetation, and soil last week, and all of those results have also been confirmed, not only by CMER, but by an outside independent expert. And I, I probably um, extended that too much. All the air sampling data has been uh, confirmed by CMER. I don't think you've done the oil, the... Um, We're still working. Yeah, yeah. So I, I will say that. I apologize. So the message that I wanted to leave you with is my biggest regret in this is that we notified four employees, four people that were on site, that their samples were negative, and then we came back and told them they were slightly positive. And I don't like to do that to people. So that's what bothers me most about this. However, our desire to be transparent, to be quick and open with the information, led us to report that data before all those checks and balances had been completed. We will continue to be open and honest with this data and transparent, and we'll continue to communicate it as quickly as we can, but it will all be reviewed by this expert before we do. Are there any questions for me? What do the samples look like before the event? The samples before the event, the baseline would be that they had not detected any activity in the urine, but I don't believe they ever requested a fecal sample. Fecal samples are only usually requested after an event or after you suspect it because it goes through the system so quickly. One of the things I didn't say this week that I've said in the past, and it's true, is that in a laboratory setting, we can see a much lower quantity of radioactivity in a fecal or a urine sample than we can in the field. 
So it's very common to see these low levels of activities in fecal samples when you work with these types of materials. It's very common. These results don't surprise me at all. Other questions? I'm not repeating the question because I think you told me I don't yeah. know what to do. Yeah, okay. you said this is working. Okay, okay. good. Ma'am, you mentioned uh, that you're comparing the, the results to several ranges, and then you mentioned that we have a natural background in this neighborhood of 310 milligram. And the average exposure of the U.S. population, I think, was mentioned in something else you put out earlier, 620 milligram per year. But that includes non-natural factors, I would assume. That's correct. And you also mentioned that you know, you're transparent, quick, open, and honest, and I grant you that. I think you could be more complete, you, with DOE, etc. And what I mean with that is that you would compare these results and these numbers that you give out, that you compare them not just to the average that we have locally or regionally, but you give us the range between maximum and minimum, or the variability, the local or regional variability, that you also tell us the national variability, what is the highest and the lowest nationally, and then planet-wide, where are the highest, or, or what is the highest and what is the lowest exposure that people experience without any noticeable deleterious consequences for their health or mortality or anything like that? Well, you are correct. There are areas of the world and the United States that are much higher than that average of 310, and you are correct. So we will, we will factor that in the next time. Other, oh. Excuse me. I've got, uh, there's been several questions online. A couple of them are asked prior to this meeting on the previous one, and so I'll go ahead and do those two, and then after that get to some of the other ones. Um, the one question was, and there was a statement too, comparing inhalation or ingestion of a plutonium particle to an x-ray is not a comparison. Please define a little bit of plutonium. And then the second question was, have the livestock on the nearby ranches been tested? I'll do the second one first. The livestock have not been tested because we haven't detected any levels of contamination in the air, in the soil, in the vegetation, or in the surface water. So no, there's been no need to test the vegetation. I understand the premise that a little bit of plutonium, I, I, yeah, I can't define that because for the purposes of this event, we're not detecting any plutonium in these employees, in all these people that we sampled. It's very low level americium that we're detecting. And so what I was trying to point out is I've, I've heard some comments that you can't compare it to a chest x-ray because a chest x-ray is a one-time thing. It's not staying in your lungs and it's not plutonium. And I know that there are people that don't believe that dose is dose, but dose is dose. It doesn't matter where the dose comes from. That's the whole purpose of that unit of millirem is to make dose equivalent no matter where it comes from, whether it's a one-time chest x-ray or whether it's contamination that's been deposited in your lungs, dose is dose. Okay, um, I currently have two more questions. Um, one of them is, is there any contamination that cannot be measured through feces or urine and would the tools for testing used by the doctors in Fukushima be useful? Uh, I don't think there's any radioactivity that cannot be detected through feces or urine. Uh, I, I don't know the answer to the question on Fukushima. I'm sorry. I don't know. Okay. Uh, this, is, this is just a statement, but I, I, you may want to address this. Um, it said, she said the test, chest detection was good for any radiation in the lungs, but not good for low energy. That's not true, though. Alpha is high energy in plutonium, and americium is alpha. So you would be missing the thing that you are looking for. Well, alpha doesn't, if I had this piece of paper up here, or if I had some contaminate, alpha contamination on my skin, it doesn't penetrate the skin. So it can't penetrate the chest wall. Low energy beta isn't gonna penetrate the chest wall either. You've gotta have high energy beta or gamma in order for it to get through to the chest wall and be detected by those detectors. And Emerson 241 gives us a image. Emerson 241, we should be able to see through a lung count, yes. And then um, I'd, I'd like to, um, Okay, this was asked, 
Um, I have, this was, a, was the urine sample of one of the individual, also one of the individuals who also tested positive as a fecal sample? No. That's all I've got right now. Okay. I have a question that maybe puts you a little bit on the spot, and that is, do you expect the additional EPA samples being taken at the request of our two senators to improve the safety of anybody? I wouldn't expect to, to improve the safety, but I do expect to improve the confidence level. I think any time an outside organization can confirm the measurements is a positive thing. It just lends more credibility. That's my opinion. Okay, I've got, I've got one more here and I'm piecing it together. Um, this is regarding the, uh, the person who did the, uh, the outside test agency for the fecal tests. Uh, the question is, who is paying this expert and what is the name of the company? Well, it was the Centers for Disease Control and it was for the urine samples. Um, and I don't know who paid for the Centers for Disease Control. They're a government agency, so... That it shouldn't have cost anything, yeah. Other questions for Fran? I have heard, and I do not know the source of this, but maybe you can address it, that um, there was some contamination found on BLM land. I don't have any more information than that. Has anyone heard anything about that? You know, I, well, we can talk about, uh, you know, when we started this, we also talked about the uh, known project that happened back in the early 60s. And there was uh, a test that was done, you know, if, if you're going out towards Lake Jow and, and uh, you're on the Jow Highway, and I don't know the numbers, I'm, since I'm from here, I just say Jow Highway and you miss the jackrabbit kind of thing. And so when you pass the shaft five, um, and you keep going, it's like mile marker seven, you take, you go south. And that's where that experiment was done and, and there's still some of that contamination uh, from back in the 60s that we continue to monitor. It's something that the government continues to monitor from back in that time frame. It was a, a detonation that was done 1,000 feet underground and uh, you can actually Google that and read the history of that. It was a known project under the Plowshare program. And so that there is some contamination from that that in that area was uh, I believe BLM land, if that's the, the source. Other questions for Fran? I've got one more for Joe. I think Joe probably. Hey. Uh, Joe, the question is: Do you have any robots on the site? Why not send a robot to do the action? To robot to the actual site and get some real samples and video and release the video us video to us right away we really want to see we want transparency we uh, we are working with sandia national labs we do have a robot it showed up and we played or played we tested the robot did some work with it and we also identified that we wanted an extension put on that robot so that uh, for camera uh, to do some visual look and uh, we sent it back to Sandia up in Albuquerque and they're bringing it back uh, this, I think tomorrow or this weekend. And so that is being uh, addressed as part of the contingency for uh, entering the mine. We looked at various robots. We looked at the, the need for going through the mine and what kind of robot would be able to be utilized. Uh, we have some tough factors in there because of the actual um, uh, density of the salt uh, trying to use that as, as a, um, wireless. Um, also, there's penetrations where you have to go through doors, uh, various aspects of that, uh, also to get in there. And, uh, you know, uh, also the, the mechanism of who was going to actually operate that and where were they going to be. And then, so we would still have to go through the same features that we're talking about now. And there would have to be evaluations as the robot made it across the uh, different uh, areas. So, all of those were looked at. We had a team that actually went through all of those and, and this, the robot that has been selected is one that we believe is the right one to be utilized for a contingency if we 
get to the panel area or wherever the, the contamination is found, and if there's an obstruction or something that keeps us from going there, we can use this instrument, this uh, robot. Other questions? Any more, Kyle? Uh, I've got one more. Somebody was going to ask The question is, what is the rough cost for paying over 1,000 employees a day their full wages while only a few are working on real things? The wage for the employees is something that uh, we continue to monitor. They, they're getting paid what they would normally. They are not sitting at home. They are actually at work. Every employee for the company is doing something right now. There's a lot of procedure changes. There's training. There's various uh, uh, teams that are put together to do analysis to help with the entry conditions. And there's a lot of other uh, aspects that, are, that go into this whole process and even looking at the recovery. So there's not one employee that is being paid that is not doing work for the facility. This is a real general question. Where did the procedures come from that you, you all are following? Where are the regulations? Are they from an incident somewhere else? Or is it just something that you've always had in case of a problem? There's a, um, there's a process that DOE has, DOE orders, that drives the regulatory side for us from the DOE, we're self-governing, uh, to make sure that we have analyzed for various um, accidents and events. And so we have uh, uh, followed that process. And so we have had, since the establishment of WIP, we've had uh, procedures, we've done uh, exercises and drills, uh, tested all of these, and then as we find things that don't work or do work, we've changed those. So we've had and have these drills or these uh, procedures in place. Um, so we, we are following that process now. Um, we are taking, making sure that we're taking the appropriate steps and the safety precautions to go through those procedures as we go through. We have one that's called, uh, the, the main one that we're utilizing right now is, is in the radiological protection program and it's a radiological work permit that will be utilized in the work packages that are developed and how they go in the underground. Very specific. And so not every event's the same. And uh, if you talk to like a firefighter, not every home fire is the same. Uh, depends what's in there and so they got to go in there protected and, and look at those things the mine is the same way and so we're taking those extra precautions but we do have all of those procedures in place other questions for Joe is it that for general questions now? well I, I did have some stuff to Joe wanted about. to talk about a few things so if you'd like we'll, we'll let him finish his discussion and then we'll get back to questions uh, just wanted to cover a couple of items. Uh, the DOE oversight continues to be going well out at the facility. We have a lot of um, support from uh, the DOE complex. Uh, it is important. Uh, I, I am the final authority on the safety side of the um, DOE um, uh, aligned to make sure that the safety for our employees, uh, I signed the final document, making sure that as they enter the mine that they're good to go. Uh, Bob McQuinn, as the president for the company, also has uh, um, accountability for that. And so as we're following through the process, we're bringing in experts from around the complex to help us make sure that we're keeping and, and, and not getting a tunnel vision on the activities that we're doing, making sure that we're monitoring and doing all the things that are right. To date, we have had about 54 different federal employees come in to our facility, and I currently have staff, 52. So we have had um, a double, uh, not all of them have been in here at the same time. We've had exchanges. Uh, um, I, I keep trying to sell them to stay and buy a home, Mayor. So I'm selling that. Um, and so, but anyway, the, the, the key for me is that we're bringing in a lot of expertise that has dealt with these kinds of situations. Now, what's really interesting for them and what I've heard back is that the mine part is something that they uh, don't have a lot of experience with. They do have experience with the contamination. So it's really key, and I said this last time, that our employees that know the mine and know um, how the mine acts uh, and how, how it, you know, how it uh, moves or what it does in the underground, 
we understand the ventilation system. Our employees know that very well, and they need to be a part of this team as we go in, into the underground. And so we're, we're bringing in, like I said, some uh, safety uh, folks from the DOE side that are providing that oversight. Also, um, the Accident Investigation Board that's doing the radiological event is really close to finishing the first phase. So if you remember, we're going to have another phase of this after they report this first one. Um, it's going to be another tough report. Uh, I've, I've, I've got to look at a piece of it, and uh, uh, they have, uh, we had to do the factual accuracy on it. Um, we will um, definitely do the same process. We'll have uh, Ted Weika come and present that to the folks here in a presentation format, and then that has to be approved before all that happens. And so we're looking at that. Uh, it could be as early as late next week or even the following week that this report comes out. After that report is done and we actually make it to the, uh, where the uh, source of the event, uh, once we determine that, then they will work through their second phase of their report and then conclude on that and then we'll be done with that, that part of it. Um, the other um, item is that we continue to provide support to, uh, like I said in the beginning, New Mexico Environmental Department, Secretary Flynn's office, uh, also the EPA, they're, they're going to be here next week, and then uh, also um, um, Dr. Hardy and, and all of the uh, samples that they're taking at this time. Um, also, uh, Brad has been with us, and today's his last day. He's from Idaho. Um, and, and he did not buy a home in Carlsbad, <laughs> so we're trying to get him to do that. Brad has been a public affairs supporting uh, Deb Gill, my, the federal employee here in Carlsbad that does live here. And we uh, have Ben Williams, as, uh, he's uh, come in from Oak Ridge and uh, Tennessee, and, he, and so you'll see some of that rotation happening as, as we uh, rotate the federal staff around. I uh, also have uh, Tom Tyner who will be uh, supporting some of the recovery as a recovery manager for DOE. He comes from Hanford um, and uh, he will be gone next week but uh, we expect him back and then we will continue to work through that process with, with uh, the federal staff as folks go in and out uh, in support of what we need here at the facility. And that was, uh, I'm open now for... Okay, before we do that, Kyle had something from the EPA that he wanted to read. Tried really hard to avoid being on the camera here, but uh, uh, at the request of uh, John, um, the EPA sent out a notice. Uh, it's titled "EPA Actions in Response to Release of Radioactive Material from the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant." Um, I'm going to go ahead and read that at his request, just for the record. Since the release of radioactive material on February 14, 2014, at WIP. EPA has been working closely with the New Mexico Environment Department in actively overseeing the actions being taken by the Department of Energy. Based on the available information, EPA does not believe that the radioactive releases from the WIP present public health concerns or regulatory compliance issues. However, EPA is in daily communication with DOE and NMED and is taking the following actions to support and provide oversight of the response effort and provide information to the public. Review of DOE's data and analysis. Data and analysis and review. EPA is reviewing data provided by DOE, NMED, and the Independent Carlsbad Environmental Monitoring and Research Center for consistency, completeness, and to identify trends or unexpected results. EPA is also conducting a verification and validation of DOE-generated lab data, which will include a review of representative portion of DOE data. Two, public dose and dispersion modeling. EPA is evaluating DOE's plume modeling and dose projections for reasonableness and rigor and also conducting independent model modeling of public dose projections using data supplied by DOE. EPA verification and review of DOE air monitoring. One, independent EPA air monitoring. EPA's RADnet monitor in Carlsbad continues to show radionuclide, radionuclide levels at background. Also, within the next one to two weeks, EPA plans to deploy three to four air samplers at the WIP facility to validate and verify DOE monitoring. These samples are expected to be located on site near existing DOE samples and will be in place for a limited period of time during DOE's re-entry into the underground. The monitors will provide extra support during re-entry as well as independent verification of DOE's monitoring network. 
As the incident response progresses, EPA will continue to reevaluate whether additional monitors are needed in the near term. Part two, evaluation of DOE environmental monitoring system. EPA is evaluating the number and location of DOE's environmental monitors to identify any needed improvements for the future to ensure adequate monitoring is in place should a similar incident occur in the future. Next category, oversight at the WIP site. On-site visits and inspections. EPA plans to continue to conduct site visits as needed to oversee DOE's management of the incident, including one, EPA staff was on-site for the initial incident assessment and to attend public meetings. Two, a more extensive site visit is planned shortly, along with the monitoring described above, to inspect the facility and gather information for EPA's review of DOE environmental monitoring. EPA will conduct a follow-on site visit to coordinate with DOE's incident investigation and to evaluate potential process improvements. Three, a complete compliance inspection will be conducted at a later date when EPA can have full access to the underground, including the waste panels. Finally, EPA communications. EPA will continue to communicate regularly with DOE and the NMED and will share information with the public on EPA's oversight actions at the WIP facility through the EPA's website and other mechanisms. So, any questions for Joe or any of the other panelists? I hope I'm not going to be as long as Kyle, uh, because he was reading into the record a letter that's available on the EPA website. The last town meeting, I asked a, a question, and that was basically to go into more detail on the reason for the shift for, uh, for the shift to filtration after the fire. And that question got sort of swatted aside by reference to the report that was available on the web. Maybe we could have done that with that letter as well. Let me just give a little background, and that is, I believe that the shift to filtration mode and filtration mode in any WIP document is related only to radiological events, nothing else. So I'm wondering whether, I, I thought the report, the accident report on the fire was a little bit thin on actually questioning the reason, the thinking behind the decision to shift to filtration, etc. I think it glided over things. Because maybe the operator at the time, and I don't cast any aspersions on any particular personnel because I think it might be a cultural issue. Did the operator, for example, possibly, thought that, uh, possibly think that what is good for controlling a red release might be good for controlling a fire and smoke? And so in that context, let me just put it to a really sharp point, my question. Is it possible that when faced with a live tiger of an underground mine fire, personnel was more concerned with a stuffed toy pussycat of a potential radiological release? If, that, if there's any indication for that, that that might have been a reason for their shift to filtration, then I believe that we have a serious problem in the safety culture at WIP, that radiological release trumps everything else, and I think we have a serious problem with wrong priorities. If you would address that, because I believe every one of you probably agrees that fire had much more potential to harm or kill people than anything we'll find on the radiological side, on which we now are spending weeks. The uh, comment and the question um, is uh, something, again, that has been identified and addressed in the Accident Investigation Board. It's in there as a, an item to, uh, to look and, and make sure that the training and emergency responses have, have been, or that those items have been properly uh, provided to the operators that have to make those decisions. Some of those are weaknesses that were identified in there also from the actual program, uh, making sure that that program uh, provided the, the, um, the training for, the, for the, the person making that decision and making sure that uh, this doesn't happen again. And so that's how that was captured. It was captured as a programmatic 
item, not the individual person themselves making a wrong decision, but it was also evaluated of why, and it drove to the higher items, which is the program. And so if you go look in there, it'll have a program item that says your emergency response, your emergency procedures, your, your conduct of ops, and it talks about um, also the emergency planning and those items that they needed um, uh, bolstering or even more assistance to make that happen. Uh, and, and you are correct. The fire had the most immediate danger than would a radiological event. There are no windows in the underground that you can break out to get out of the fire. You, you are there as, as an individual relying on the expertise and knowledge of the personnel that have control of the ventilation system on the surface. It's imperative that they understand and know from the training that they receive and the drills and exercises, the emergency management program, that they are proficient and know that they have folks in their hands from the safety aspect that they could actually potentially cause a fatality if they do something wrong for something as serious as an underground fire. That is very key for us to make sure that we don't lose that peace. As we get better at this, as we, you know, we increase the, the emergency management program, the training programs, the conduct of ops. And so that is my focus. When we put these corrective action plans and the mitigative actions we put in place today that I'm reviewing almost every day that Bob McQuinn signs the letter, says, here's my protective for today because we're going to go in the underground and here's what we're going to do. That is what I'm looking at. That very same thing that you're talking about. And it's imperative that we, the management team, do not lose focus of that, especially right now where people are wanting us to hurry up and get to the panel. That is exactly what I cannot do. And it's my job to make sure that I keep my staff safe. And that's, that is in the programs that we're going to implement as we come out of this event. Generically speaking, I agree with you that that is in that report. But there are not many specifics. But let me point, you out, point out to you two other things that are just a sample of what I found not that good in the report. Let's say it that way. For example, it says in one place, significant buildup of smoke in the mine and smoke in areas where personal was expected to have good air. So I assume that everybody thinks that that expectation was reasonable. But then in another place it says, when the um, person changed the ventilation to filtration during the incident, that potentially affected the locations of good air and concentration of CO to, uh, CO to smoke in areas workers have been trained and expected to. Well, first it says, yes, there was significant buildup of smoke in the mine where people expected good air, and, that's th and then it says that potentially affected the locations of good air. I really don't think that this report was reviewed sufficiently for internal consistency. Is there a question? I mean, the report is out. The, the key for us is this. It identified an issue. We have to fix that issue. That's the bottom line. And so I'm, that's my commitment to the project, is even if it says potential, we're going to go evaluate that, and we're going to evaluate all the potentials that were in there, all the Johns that were talked about, all the cons, and all those items that are identified in the report, even if it's contradictory in one but it's captured on one of the others, we are still going to go look at that activity, make sure that we have fixed it. Joe, I've got three more total online, and I think I'll have to stop it probably there, and we can get to the rest if they ask for some more next time. Uh, the first one is Jim Conka stated that they have hot waste down there at seven curies per liter. One liter could contaminate one billion chickens to 50 barrel per pound, too dangerous to eat. What if 20 barrels of this busted open? I'm not uh, familiar with Jim Conca's uh, calculation. Uh, I would prefer they talk to Jim Conca. I'm not sure what he's comparing it to. Or Maybe they can follow up and we can try to get a, another. Yeah. Uh, the next question is, are there monitoring, is there monitoring on sites and follow-up path beyond WIP? 
property and beyond Carlsbad, assuming the wind has carried possible contaminants off site, will they consider whole body counters? Want to ask that again? Yes. Okay. Is there monitoring on sites in fallout path beyond WIP property and beyond Carlsbad, assuming the wind has carried possible contaminants off site? And then will they consider whole body counters? I'm going to pass this to Brian. We do have air monitors both on the WIP site and off the WIP site. The ones that are off the WIP site sort of ring the WIP site, if you will. Um, the ones that were in the path of the direction of the air, the highest one was the far field sample location. It's about a half a mile outside of the 16 sectors of the WIP site. Ten side. We've got a slide that shows that. Within the 60, you're right. Thank you, Joe. There you go. So if you look at that, you, you can. This is the one I'm referring to, Farfield. So it's within the 16 and just outside of the site. That was the one that we found the most contamination on, and it was very low level in in the order of 50 to 60 d per m. Uh, the others, didn't, we didn't detect any activity. And that activity on that filter paper was gone the next time we pulled that filter paper. So it was from the release, and it was very quick. <coughs> Last week, I talked about how when the air activity comes out of the exhaust duct, it's in, in essence diluted in all of the air around it. We haven't found activity anywhere off-site since this event. And all of the samples that we pull are basically the same as they were the year before. So it was a small release. It was over a relatively short period of time. And it hasn't been followed by air activity off-site after that. Want to do one more? Sure. OK, uh, this is a question for you, actually. It says, most simple analysis of equivalent dose comparing external to internal is a multiplier of 20 for integral compared to it, for integral internal compared to external but for plutonium this wr multiplier ranges from 115,000 to around 500 what wr are you using to calculate the doses dose i'm not using a wr to calculate doses dose in in what i'm discussing tonight i i did say and i stand by it that the whole reason to convert deeper m into millirem is to have the what we call qualification factors for the for the type of radionuclide that is in the lungs and so that millirem calculation takes into not only biological effect of that radionuclide but also the qualities of the radionuclide okay and then the lady has to clarify if there's soil testing in water i think you yes about we, that there has been air vegetation soil and surface water and we also collected some puddles for, from a brief rain shower and analyze those as well. Okay, uh, It's almost time uh, to wrap things up. We got time for one more question here in the audience. Anybody have any follow-on questions? Yes. I really don't have a question. I just wanted to... Is this one? Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to say there's a few handouts here uh, in reference to what Kyle had read, if anybody would like, um, regarding EPA's actions response. So I'm just going to set them over here if anybody would like to take one. I didn't bring a whole lot, but help yourself. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Joe, would you like to finish with any comments? Right, can I have your sure. Now, this statement is really for you, Mr. Mayor. Um, today, um, Blodgett Street Baptist Church baked a thousand cookies and delivered them to as many of the WIP facilities that they had access to and along with it was a note from the pastor that encouraged us, said they were praying for us, and basically said, keep up the good work. And so you can be proud of this city and the support that they have for this project. Joe? Uh, we will continue to have these every week. Uh, thank you for the questions. It's important that you feel that we're answering your questions. and. Uh, if not, continue to uh, work through us, and we'll uh, make sure that we can try to do that. 
I wanted to uh, share the same uh, item that Bob uh, Kerman said. Uh, the cookies were great. Uh, the letter from the pastor was excellent. And uh, I'm proud to be a guy from Carlsbad. Thank you all.